Hi, I'm Michael Poldy, CEO of Poldy Resiliency Partners, and I welcome you to part three of our four-part series on OSHA COVID-19 in the workplace. OSHA's guidance on mitigating and preventing the spread of COVID-19, while it's relatively straightforward, there are a number of questions that we would like to answer and help you as you organize your workplace to create a safe environment for your employees and for your organization and your clients. With me today is my partner, Michael Goldman. Michael is Director of Occupational Safety and Health, and Michael also has three decades of field and health and safety experience. He has a Master's of Public Health from Emory University. He is a certified industrial hygienist, a certified safety professional, and he is also certified on ISO 45001, the International Safety and Health Standard. Michael, welcome. Glad to be here. So what are we gonna talk about in part three? Okay, well, in uh, part one, we talked about recognizing the hazards and setting a program up, establishing an effective uh, program for reducing employee exposure to COVID-19. In section two, we talked about how to manage an ongoing program. So we assume the program is already set up, what you need to do on an ongoing basis to keep the program running. In part three, what we're gonna look at is what OSHA is expecting in terms of training and workplace communication. Uh, you have to look at a program as communication between the employers uh, and, and the employees and how information about this program is going to go back and forth, what we're expecting out of our employees and what OSHA is expecting out of employers in terms of how they're gonna train and communicate this program. Sounds great. All right, quick, uh, quick update on who we are. We reduce IT risk and improve employee safety. That's what we're about. We focus specifically on ways we can improve your business resiliency to respond and react and hopefully avoid problems in your workplace and environment so you can protect your business, protect your employees, and protect your clients. Okay, so one of the ways that, uh, you know, we, we said this information is going to go back and forth in sort of a flow, uh, we're going to look at, at training and what OSHA expects out of training on this policy. So it's not enough that you just put a policy and a program together and let it sit there. It's actually got to live and breathe. And that information has got to make it to all the employees. And the way it's going to do that is through a training program. So one of the things that we have to have to look at is that this training program is going to have to be in a format and a language that our employees understand. Perfect example is if you write it all in English and you get out on your shop floor and everybody out there speaks Spanish, you're not going to have a very, uh, very effective program if they can't understand it. And I've been in workplaces all over the country and seen all sorts of different languages. I have worked in one factory, oddly enough, where everybody in the front office spoke English, everybody on the floor spoke Burmese. And so, you know, they had to translate every single one of these programs into Burmese for people to, uh, to uh, understand it. Uh, so you've got to, got to do it uh, clearly, frequently in language that they understand. And there's actually a caveat in this guideline by OSHA that includes American Sign Language. Uh, so you have to be prepared uh, for that if you have people that, uh, that cannot hear and depend on sign language to communicate. So these communications, the things they need to in, include are the basic facts about COVID-19 and the workplace policies and procedures that you've implemented to protect workers from exposure. Okay, so all of these items that we've been talking about, providing personal protective equipment, implementing social distancing, uh, uh, providing face mask, temperature checks at the door, all of these kinds of things, you have to let these people know what all this stuff is for. Okay, so you have to tell them we're going to be implementing these programs and here's why. Okay, you, and you also have to track which workers have been informed. You have to keep records of this training. And uh, one of the best ways to do this is have them sign off on the training and take a short quiz to prove that they were there, they understood what they were trained, and they can give this information back. And ensure that workers understand that they've got uh, a right to, to a safe and healthful environment to work in. And if they're not feeling safe and if they have questions, they need to know who to contact. Uh, so this brings us back to the concept of our uh, COVID-19 coordinator. That's gonna be the best place to start. 
also keep in mind, and we've mentioned this before in earlier modules, that it is perfectly legal for an employee to contact OSHA or NIOSH or the CDC if they have serious enough concerns and they are protected by the uh, whistleblower stand protection standard if they, uh, if they choose to do so. Okay, next slide. Okay, I, we talked a little bit about language considerations and uh, you know, we're gonna hit it again because I can't stress this enough. This is something that OSHA will cite you for if you don't take it seriously enough. So uh, be prepared to trans have your program translated, bring in translators to conduct the, uh, the training if, if absolutely necessary, and to uh, make sure that they understand the information that you're, you're giving them. I've seen training really poorly done in a lot of workplaces where somebody just puts a DVD in a room full of people and walks out and they're just expected to understand what's on the DVD. It's not gonna cut it, which is gonna, OSHA will, will cite you for that. So make sure that this training is an opportunity for two-way communication and also that workers are able to self-report in their own language and in a, in a method that they, uh, they understand and can communicate freely in. Next slide. Okay, quarantine and isolation. Uh, if we have workers that have been potentially infected, we need to make sure that we have made adjustments for them to stay home and isolate if necessary. Uh, we're going to need to minimize the negative impact of quarantine and isolation on, on workers. And if someone shows up to work and they're ex exhibiting symptoms, we need to make sure that they know it's time for them to go home, quarantine, get tested, uh, and if necessary, have the uh, required 14, uh, 14 days of quarantine where they're not exposing other workers. And as a employer, this is something that you're gonna need to be ready for. Uh, we all know uh, the negative impacts of people calling in sick or people, uh, people disappearing from their station when they're supposed to be there. Uh, but, you know, this is a very serious situation uh, they are uh, protected under the jurisdiction of OSHA if they need to quarantine and isolate. So be ready for uh, have workers having to, having to be out for 14 days quarantining. So if they can work from home, great. If there's a uh, way for them to uh, remotely do their uh, duties, that's perfect. Maybe kind of tough in some manufacturing or construction situations, but uh, we need to uh, do what we can to make sure that, uh, that our workers have the op opportunity to quarantine and isolate if it's necessary. All right, next slide. Okay, screening and testing. Uh, I don't believe that OSHA is expecting you to bring testing equipment and personnel into a workplace. What I believe OSHA is looking at, what they're looking for is that you as an employer uh, are allowing time and resources for your workers to, uh, to be tested. So if someone says, I'm gonna be two hours late because I'm going in to get a COVID test, uh, you, we may have to allow for that. Uh, luckily, the testing is free everywhere that I've seen. Uh, this is not a citation that I have seen OSHA uh, cite anyone for yet. I have not seen them cite uh, a workplace because people could not get tested. Uh, there's testing in the evening, there's testing on weekends, but uh, we need to uh, make sure that our workers know that uh, they can be screened and tested and know how to find those resources. And we should encourage as much testing as possible. Um, I've kept a cadence of once a month for the last year, and uh, I don't think something like that is, uh, is unreasonable. So, uh, you know, I, we should be able to, uh, to, to help our workers find testing and uh, make sure they're getting tested and screened. Okay, to summarize what we uh, talked about today uh, under the heading of training and, uh, and communication, conduct training and make sure you can track it. So if an OSHA compliance officer shows up and says, uh, have you trained all your people? You say yes, and he says, prove it. Make sure you've got a record of that training. Uh, if, it's not, if there's no record, didn't happen. Uh, also make sure that you're able to communicate in the employee's language. Uh, prepare for uh, quarantine and isolation should they need to, uh, to do so and promote screening and testing.
So those are the four bullet points that we hit uh, today under the jurisdiction of training and communication. And thanks, Mike, for today's discussion. Um, if you have questions, please contact us at pooldpartners.com. Our emails are listed on the screen. Please join us for part four of our four-part series next time. Thanks a lot.